Lord, that we just preach all the right ones to say, Lord. Uh, expect our hearts to remain close to you, Lord, to be with us uh, to be the rest of uh, Sunday with the Lord. Amen. Amen. May be seated. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the morning service here at Catherine Baptist Church. It's good seeing all of you here. Uh, we've got some visitors back here in the back with us. This is part of the Dunn family. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to get all the names. I do remember, surprisingly, this is not very often I get this correct, but I think it's Rhonda and Betty. Is that right? From Wednesday night. They were here Wednesday night. And uh, that's not very often I remember names that long, but I did get their names. So I was, I was happy about that. Uh, but it's good seeing all of you here, and uh, we're excited to be in God's house. I'm excited to be in God's house. You know? yeah. uh, it's just, it's a great time to be a Christian. Uh, Dave kind of touched on this in the adult Sunday school class about the chaos that goes on in the world. I'm just glad I know I'm saved. I'm glad I know this world is not my home, and I'm just passing through. And boy, what a great thing that is to know. And uh, God, even in all of this, God is directing us in these things, and and he is with us as we go through stuff in life here. Uh, I've got a few announcements and things to let you know about. If you would be praying, I don't see uh, Hunter and Kayla uh, be praying for Kayla. She is uh, ready to go anytime. She's, I think their plan is to induce her tomorrow at 1030. Uh, she has already dilated a little bit and uh, is having some contractions. But uh, her due date was actually, original due date was yesterday, and then they moved it back, I think it was two weeks, uh, and she still hasn't gone, so they might be having a 14-pound baby, <laughs> and we just don't know, but uh, I know she is, she's really ready, so pray for her if you would, uh, I'm sure she's miserable and she'd appreciate your prayers, uh, but just pray that all goes well. Uh, also... Uh, the spaghetti dinner is coming up here next Sunday. That will be at the uh, Ballard Volunteer Fire Department. Uh, they do that by uh, donation only. So if you'd like to get you a nice spaghetti meal, uh, spaghetti dinner there, and uh, so you don't have to cook, that would be great. That would help out the fire department locally here as well. That's from 12 to 3. Uh, they'll be doing that. And then also, uh, just to continue to remind you about the church directory uh, updates, uh, they are in the vestibule. And uh, I think some of you, many of you have filled that out, but if you have been in the directory in the past and you changed maybe a phone number, if you would, make sure that gets in there as well so we have your updated contact information. Um, and then the 15th, uh, we have a lot of things that's going on uh, on the 15th, but Angel uh, Kessner and Ethan Lee are uh, getting married. There is a sign-up sheet in the best if you plan to attend the wedding, that will help them out. Uh, to know about how many they can plan to attend. But that is at 2 o'clock at Cumberland Heights Baptist Church. And uh, that's an exciting time. It's a nervous time, though. So I remember that when Becky and I got married, uh, yeah, it was just, of course, brides have a lot of work involved with it, the planning, all that. Grooms are just kind of, oh, you know, kind of there, uh, most of the time, anyway. But I remember after we said I do, and, and the preacher pronounced us man and wife, and we started walking down the aisle, I just felt this huge weight of responsibility, like, I'm responsible for this person now. <laughs> it was like, this is different. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, it's a blessing how God works all that out, and the two do really become one flesh. And, uh, and Dave mentioned this. Dave and Patty's anniversary, 45th anniversary, uh, said, you know, eventually you get to a point where you just don't hardly remember a time you haven't been married. Uh, and that is the way it is. You get there and uh, you just, it's like you've always been there. And even when Becky and I weren't married, it's kind of like we always knew each other and just think God had a plan for us to be together and, and had worked it all out. So I'm excited for them. And uh, but if you would, if you're planning on going to the wedding, make sure you sign that sign up sheet out there. And then also the Ballard Baptist Church Ladies Fellowship Luncheon. If you were looking for the sign up sheet, I've got it up here. Uh, I pulled it from the back. Um, we have a few names on there right now. But if you are planning to go and did not sign the sign up sheet, if I don't have your name on the sign up sheet, I wonder if you'd let me know right now. If you're planning on going to that and your name's not on the sign up sheet, okay, one, two, anybody else? Three. Do you have anybody else going with you? Four, five, I got your name there. <laughs> Becky's going to be speaking, so her name's on there. Okay, so four more, so I need to add those there. 
And uh, that way, they'll probably call and ask for a count uh, this afternoon. And uh, so that way we can make sure that we are taken care of there. But uh, that's a pretty good little group uh, for that. That'll be on the 15th as well from 10 to 1. Uh, Becky will be the first speaker there. And then uh, Mrs. Debbie Sanderson will be the second speaker. And then, of course, the wedding will be after that. And then also the Sunday school, the adult Sunday school class is talking about going uh, to uh, pass out some gospel tracts, maybe hold some gospel signs or something for the Virginia Tech football game. That will also be on the 15th. Uh, so a lot of things happen there uh, on that particular day. Um, and then also want to mention tomorrow we are starting uh, School of Bible classes. If you uh, have thought about uh, doing that in the past and have not done that, what the School of Bible classes are for it's basically to help us get a little more grounded in some of the basics of the Christian faith. There's, I think, uh, there's 15 actual classes we've gone through, and then we've added three more classes. A couple of them were just questions and answers. Uh, you could ask whatever question you want. We spent time going through the answers. We'll probably do that again sometime. Uh, and then uh, there was another class we offered. It was just difficult subjects uh, in the Bible. And we try to always go into the Bible and dig through the Bible. And I, matter of fact, in one of those classes, I even teach you how to study your Bible. This is how, you know, if I'm going to study something, this is how I do it. And we actually did that uh, over a passage of Scripture, and we actually broke it down. And I think it was very helpful uh, for the people. But the classes we're offering this semester are the New Testament Church, the Life of Christ, and Survey of the New Testament II. Uh, and they will be in that order. Uh, they start tomorrow evening. Uh, there aren't any tests or anything like that for the classes, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, I just need to know so I can make sure I have materials printed for you. Um, they start at 6.30. Each class is 40 minutes. We take a five-minute break in between the class, uh, each class, and then it's very informal. Uh, we usually, we almost always try to have snacks over there. Uh, it's just hard to have school and Bible without snacks. Um, and my kids have been doing this ever since we started it, which was like eight years ago. Uh, and Abigail, I think, has been through these classes we have now. I think this is like her third time through it, maybe. I don't know. She's just like, <laughs> but she likes the snacks. And she has to have Bible for her own school anyway, so that's part of what she gets for Bible class. Uh, but anyway, if you'd like to attend that and like to go or just come and see what's going on and maybe check it out, you're welcome to do that as well. Uh, and that starts at 630 tomorrow evening. And then uh, I've got some upcoming dates in the bulletin just to make you aware of some things going on. Uh, Brother Earl Ank will be here with us on the 16th of October. And then we have Faith Promise Sunday coming up in November. Uh, have the dates for the Christmas play practice, the Thanksgiving meal and service, uh, and then some other Christmas activities we have coming up when those dates will be, uh, just so you can have an idea there. But uh, that's all the announcements. No, it's not either. I'm sorry. There's one other thing I wanted to give you. I had a card here to read, and I, I thought I was going to miss it. Um, but uh, this is a, a really beautiful card here. It says, there are certain people we thank in our prayers uh, for things we appreciate. So, uh, but try as we may, we sometimes can say the words that we want them to know. There are people who often go out of their way to pitch in when there's work to be done. They show understanding. They lighten our problems. They help us in more ways than one. And it says there are certain people we thank in our prayers, and one of those people is you. And this comes to say, may God bless you forever and all you do. Thank you for all your cards, uh, words of kindness, the meal after the service, and most of all your thoughts and prayers. And love you all, the Burroughs family. And uh, you continue to pray for them. Uh, they've been through a rough uh, month or so with uh, passing John's brother and also his dad. So pray for uh, his mom as well, if you would. But that's all the announcements I have. So let's all stay in. Let's welcome one another to our service and then prepare for our Sunday morning.
blessing here on the offering. And as we go to more prayer, I'm going to ask you mind praying for the offering, please. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for another day here in the Lord's house. And thank you for your services so far in Sunday school lesson. Thank you for all your many blessings. And thank you for Jesus Christ and for eternal salvation. We pray for those who, who may not know you. We pray for the lost. Mm -hmm. Lord, pray for the rest of the service. A blessed preacher wall. Um, help us to have attentive hearts and listen and apply these messages to our lives. I pray for the offering to be used in your work. In your kingdom, in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, maybe soon. Mm -hmm.
let's turn number 222. Let's stand and sing. There is a fountain. 222. States, it's a year, but the Lord will uh, supply in that sense. So, uh, anyway, again, I do thank you for your prayers and I do continue to desire those prayers. And the song this morning simply is entitled, Oh, What a Day. And there's a song, What a Day That Will Be When My Jesus I Shall See. And that could be even this day if we believe it is close at hand. But listen to the words, Oh, What a Day. <clears throat> Some of these days when we reach heaven, where there will come no wrong, hallelujah, oh, what a day, that wonderful day will be up yonder when the redeemed. 
king shall lift their voices, singing a glad new song in heaven. Oh, what a day that wonderful day will be. Oh, what a day there's going to be singing and shouting yonder joy for the saints, happy saints, on the morning of Jubilee. Just put on the crown that's given, glad to walk around all over God's heaven. Oh, what a day that wonderful day will be. Heaven will be a little brighter if I may find you there. Oh, what a day that wonderful day will be up yonder as you stand in that countless number. There will be joy to share in heaven. Oh, what a day that wonderful day will be. Oh, what a day there's going to be singing and shouting yonder joy for the saints. On the morning of Jubilee, just put on the crown that's given. Glad to walk around all over God's heaven. Oh, what a day that wonderful day will be. Oh, what a day there's going to be singing and shouting yonder joy for the saints, happy saints. On the morning of Jubilee, Jubilee, just put on the crown that's given. Glad to walk around all over God's heaven. Oh, what a day, that wonderful day will be. Some people say, well, that just seems unjust. 
No, this is why we have a responsibility. God is calling people into the ministry. He's calling missionaries to go. Uh, even young ladies, there's a young lady we had in our church here probably five years ago. Uh, she is in Ukraine. I got a letter from her uh, just the other day. She still, I think she has moved in Ukraine. She's like in another area, but she was on the eastern side of Ukraine uh, where the capital was, and then this war breaks out. But God is using her in a great way. And some people are afraid for their safety when they go to the mission field. You know the safest place that you'd ever be is in God's will. Right. But you know what people need everywhere? They need the same thing. They need a vision. They need God's word. But this is also referring to not just God's word. It's referring to uh, kind of like a, a picture or a plan. And God almost, it's not even like a dream, but it's just like, Okay, where is God leading us? Where he is directing us? And if you have no goal for your life, well, you're going to hit it every time. Uh, you're just going to be wandering aimlessly through life, and that's not what God wants for you. So where there is no vision, the people perish. Let's pray and we'll get right into the message. Father, we thank you for the scriptures. I pray that you will help me. Uh, help me as I have several things to say, but help me to be brief and to the point. And I pray that as we look at some scriptures here, that, Lord, you will allow the word of God to penetrate our hearts. And uh, I pray that it might make a change in each and every one of our lives. Father, we ask these things now in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> I've simply entitled this message, A Vision for Our Future. Now, me as a pastor of Catherine Baptist Church, I believe God has a plan. I think God is leading us as a church. Uh, and we just kind of simply... Go as God leads. He's directing us. He's got a plan for us. And uh, we just simply need to do it. But some things I need to let you know about to start with. Now, if you don't have a Bible in front of you, we do have some Bibles in the pews that you can use. I strongly encourage you to do that when we look at some of these scriptures. Or if there is a person next to you that has a Bible you don't have one, please don't hesitate to share that. Because a couple of these passages, it will be very important. You'll get much more out of it if you can see what it is that I'm talking about here. But I think we need to understand, if we're going to think about a vision for our church, what is a successful church? Uh, many churches in this world, the world itself, has success defined a way that God does not define. Uh, success is not defined by how many people are in the pews. And thank God that the Lord's house is full uh, this morning. But it's not defined by our numbers. It's not defined by our offerings. It's not defined by anything like that. The successful church has two characteristics. And here's what they are. Obedience to the will of God. That's the first, first characteristic. The second one is our likeness to Jesus Christ. If you are like Jesus Christ and you are obedient to the will of God and we are like that collectively as a church, we are a successful church. Whether we run 50,000 or we run 50, it doesn't matter. We are a successful church. Luke 19, 11 says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. That is God's heart. It is to reach lost people. It is God is not willing that any should perish. I, I mentioned that verse in the adult Sunday school class. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Uh, it says there in 2 Timothy, speaking of God, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. God wants every single person to be saved and to have the truth of his word, but not everyone's going to receive it. Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20 is where we would find part of the Great Commission, and this is to every Christian. Now, if you have placed your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, this is to you. The Great Commission is for you. It is for me. It is not just for people who are in the ministry. It's not just for people who uh, work in a church or teach a Sunday school class. It is for every single believer. So what is Matthew 28, 19, and 20? Well, it starts off, go is the first word. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And one thing we're supposed to do after people get saved is we are to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And uh, we're to teach them to observe all things whatsoever he's commanded us. That is what we're to do. So we're to give the gospel, see people get saved, 
Then we're to encourage them to follow the Lord in believers' baptism. Now, baptism does not save you. Baptism is an identity. It's, it's showing others, it's a testimony, that you have been saved. Right. I'm identifying right. myself with the Lord Jesus Christ. I am dying. I'm being buried. I am rising again from the dead to walk in newness of life. That is what baptism is. It is a picture of that. There is a baptism that saves you. But it's a baptism we can't see. It's the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Right. That is a baptism that does save you. That's the moment you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. God fully immerses you in himself. And we can't see it. It can take place in the pew. It can take place here at the altar. We've had some people get saved back in our uh, Sunday school office where they would be dealt with after the service. We've had other people get saved in different parts of the building when uh, some kids get saved over in children's church. We've had people saved different places, and where they got saved was when they were baptized in the Holy Ghost. Right. But after you get baptized, you have been saved, and then you get baptized by immersion, which is a picture of your salvation. Then God wants you to join a local New Testament church because God is not working in this world to seek and to save that which was lost. He's not working through individuals. He's working through local New Testament churches, and he's using individuals in those local New Testament churches to accomplish his will. Right. And I can give you scriptures for that as far as uh, how important the church is to Jesus Christ. He loved the church so much he gave his life yeah. for the church. That's right. That's the right. church is the body of Christ. It is the bride of Jesus Christ. So the successful church is our obedience to the will of God. And it is our likeness to Jesus Christ. Now I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. I mentioned the first part of this message is practical. And here is the practical part. Romans chapter 10. If you're going to lead somebody to the Lord, and I was to ask you, do you feel comfortable... And I don't want you to raise your hand, but if I was to say, if you, how many of you feel comfortable taking your Bible and showing them how they can be saved? Yeah, you know, I would say probably not every hand would go up if we're honest. Probably, honestly, maybe 30% of the hands would go up that they felt comfortable showing somebody from the Bible how they can be saved. Well, there's an easy way to do that. Uh, I don't have one in my pocket. Usually I stick one in my pocket or a couple in my pocket. But you can take a gospel track. Matter of fact, when I first started out, I just used to read the verses out of the gospel tract to people uh, to try to teach them how to be saved uh, because I didn't know what I was doing. Then I learned there were some verses that we call the Romans Road. Uh, Romans 3.23, for all sin that comes short of the glory of God. And then we have Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then Romans 5.8, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then we have Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then as you get those four basic verses down, then you can start adding a few other verses here and there. And here in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, we're going to see Paul is encouraging the church of Rome. He wants them to be a successful church. I want us to be a successful church. God wants us to be a successful church. He's encouraging them to win people to Jesus Christ. So Romans chapter 10, verse 9, look if you would there with me. It says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Now let me stop right there for a second. That's where some people stop in their personal life. Yeah. They confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus. They sing, oh how I love Jesus, oh how I love Jesus. But there's no faith in the heart. When there's faith in the heart, it'll change you. Amen. God will change you. You don't have to stay the same. God will make sure things change in your life little by little. You still have to do some things. You have to get God's word in your heart, and then his word will change you. But we don't just confess with our mouth. We do need to confess with our mouth, but that's not where it stops. Look what else it says. And shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Notice these next four words. Very powerful. Thou shalt be saved. Now that was the strongest language God can use there. It doesn't say... Thou might be saved. 
Uh, you may be saved if you had a religious, a religious experience. It doesn't say you shall be saved if uh, you live a good life from that point forward. It doesn't say any of that. It says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, you believe in your heart, yep. thou shalt Amen. be saved. Amen. Look at verse 10. Amen. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. This is why this works this way. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. And here's verse 13. For whosoever, and I'm thankful I am a whosoever, and so are you. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's that strong language again. Shall be saved. God is promising us here, and God cannot lie. God cannot break a promise. He says, if you put your faith and trust in me, you shall be saved. Now, what happens after you get saved? God expects some things from you because he gave his life for you. And that would be our reasonable service just to say, Lord, you gave your life for me. Let me give my life now to you. So what does he expect from us? Well, first of all, I mentioned this already. He expects us to follow him in believer's baptism. If you have placed your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, maybe you got saved here in a church service, and I try to give an invitation after every service, and uh, maybe you prayed and you never raised your hand and said, yes, I prayed and accepted Christ. But you have done that, but you've never followed the Lord in believer's baptism. That is the first step of obedience Amen. for the Christian. That is identifying yourself the Lord Jesus Christ. There have been people in this church who've been in this church for years, Six years, seven years, and never been baptized, and thankfully, they got it settled and got baptized. Yeah. I'm proud of people like that, because that's hard. The devil wants to kick you while you're down, and he wants to beat you up and say, well, you failed God. You should have done that a long time ago. What are people going to think? It doesn't matter what people yeah, think. Man, right. What matters is what God thinks. That's, right. yeah. that's all that we ought to be concerned yeah. with. So if you've been saved and not been scripturally baptized, this is the practical side. You need to come up after the service, let me know, say, hey, I've trusted, or maybe as you're walking out the door, I've trusted Christ as my Savior, I need to be baptized. I'll be happy to talk to you, make sure you understand what's going on, I'll explain to you what happens up here, there's nothing you have to say, I do everything for you, but you need to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. We are commanded to do that. Now, the second thing that happens, once you got saved, and then you follow the Lord in believer's baptism, and you can actually do this at the same time that you get baptized, is you need to join a local New Testament church. Yeah. Yeah. God expects you to join a church. And what does joining a church mean? Does that mean just showing up for services and attending? No. That means you need to come and actually say, I want to be a, I want to be a part of this church family. That means now you can hold me accountable and I can hold you accountable. And... There are responsibilities that need to be met. So it's responsibilities and accountabilities. If you come to the church and you just attend the church, you're welcome to attend the church without being a member. You can do that all the time. But let me say this as lovingly as I can. You cannot be a good Christian if you're saved and have never been baptized by immersion. You cannot be a good Christian if you've been saved and baptized by immersion. And they're not a member of a local New Testament church. It's impossible. Scriptures teach us that. That is God's will for each of our lives. Now, that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to do these things. Matter of fact, Paul is presenting an argument here. And then once we become a part of the local New Testament church, once we do these things, he wants us now, God wants us to be a witness for him. He wants us to go out and say, hey, Guess what happened to me? I got saved. Now, you don't have to wait until you're baptized and then wait until you join the church to do that. You ought to do that right from the get-go. Hey, guess what happened to me? God saved me from my sins. Let's read on here in verse 14. Now, he just says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Now, this is Paul's argument. He kind of goes in reverse order here. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Now a preacher, the word preacher right here, is not talking about me. 
It is talking about every believer as a preacher. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what it's referring to. Look at verse 15. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. Who's preaching the gospel of peace? Every single believer ought to be preaching the gospel of peace. Right. Yeah. Yeah. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace? Why? Because they are going with the good news of Jesus Christ. And it says, and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now, what we're seeing here in verses 14 through 15 is we are seeing Paul's argument as he presents it. He says, first of all, they must call on the name of the Lord in verse 13. But how are they going to call? They need to call in order to be saved. But then how can they call unless they believe? You have to have faith. You have to believe before you can call. Then he says, in order for them to believe, they have to hear the truth. You can't be saved apart from the Word of God. It does not happen. It will not happen. It cannot happen. You can't just say, I've had a religious experience. I've got an agreement with God. None of that works. It is the truth of God's Word that's going to save you. We are saved through the Word of God. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Verse 17 tells us that. So Paul goes on here. He says, how can they believe if they don't hear the truth? And then... Someone, how are they going to hear the truth if someone does not tell them the truth? Someone does not give them the truth. Now, if you have a little gospel track and you leave that gospel track somewhere, now nobody has told them that truth, but they pick that gospel track up and read it and get saved from it. Somebody had to carry the message. They laid the gospel track down. That is the same as telling you're going to a grocery store. You pass a gospel track out to somebody. That is the same as telling. You talk to a coworker. You talk to a friend, a family member. You're telling them. Maybe you just invite them to church because you're not sure what else to do. That is part of the telling. How shall they hear except someone tell them? And then notice also how can they be told, how can they tell them except they be sent? This is the Holy Ghost job. He saves us. He wants us to be sent. With the gospel. That is part of Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. If we are saved, we are also sent with the gospel. Now, this is all the practical stuff. James 3 1 tells us not to be many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. What is a master? A master is like a teacher. It says, be not many masters or teachers, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. In other words, God's going to hold our feet a little closer to the fire. Yeah. Yeah. If you're a Sunday school teacher or if you're a pastor of a church or you're a missionary or evangelist, God's going to hold you more responsible because of what you're doing. That's why it says, be not many masters or teachers, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Now, we can't all be teachers. But we can all be reachers. That's important. Every one of us should be a reacher. So if we're saved, if you got saved, you have a story to tell. Every one of us has a story to tell. Every Christian is a witness, is a witness for the Lord. Every single Christian is a witness for the Lord. But here's the thing. Some are a good witness. Right. And some are a poor witness. Yeah. 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 What type are we? Yep. This is the practical part of the message. Now, along this road of life, after we get saved, it's not all a bed of roses. Any Christian can tell you that. The devil's going to fight you at every turn, but I'm thankful that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I've got the King of Kings and Lord of Lords fighting on my side. I've got the same God who fought with David, who's killed Goliath with a slingshot and a stone. That's the same God I serve. He's the same God protecting me and watching over me. He's the same God protecting you and watching over you. Mm -hmm. yep. But along this road of life, we're going to hit many bumps in the road. Mm -hmm. Now, how does God set up the way for you to be helped to be a reacher? Remember what God's, what God's will is? He came to seek and to save that which is lost. 
That is the heartbeat of God. If we're going to be a successful Christian, we need to be obedient to the will of God, and we need to be like Jesus Christ. So his heart ought to be our heart. We ought to desire to see people saved. We ought to desire to see them to grow in the Lord. So what is God's means to help us all be reachers? Turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. This is all fitting into a vision of our future, a vision of our local New Testament church. So God's means for to help us to all be reachers, Ephesians chapter 4, look at verse 11. Now he talks here in chapter 4 of Ephesians, he talks about unity over and over again. But in verse 11 he says this, And he, speaking of God, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Now, some of you may be scratching your head and saying, what in the world did he just say there? Well, I'm going to explain it to you. Very, it's very simple when you break it down and look at it individually. Here is God's means to help us, for, to help you basically be a reacher of the gospel to other people. First of all, look what he says in verse 11. He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. That's what I'm doing right now. God gave me to you to help you get this job done. Now, what is my job to help you to do? He says in verse 12, it is for the perfecting of the saints. Now, that word perfecting means to give you the tools to be able to do the work. <coughs> Look what it says next. It says, for the work of the ministry. The work of the ministry is actually using the tools that were given. This is what all this is for. And look at the next thing. It says, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, the edifying is how we can become a master craftsman, if you would, at using these tools. You see, everybody who maybe starts out in construction work, and they start out as a carpenter, and they learn how to do some of the basic things, they don't all of a sudden become a master craftsman. But the more experience they have, the more things they learn along the way, the more uh, little hints and shortcuts and all this other stuff that they use helps them to become a master craftsman. It helps them to use their tools more effectively. That's what he's saying. God gives us evangelists, but evangelists aren't here all the time. He gives us pastors and teachers for this purpose. He gives us other things there in verse 11. Now, why does he give us these things? Again, he wants us all to be reachers. But look at verse 13 through 15. Look how many times the likeness of Jesus Christ is mentioned. It says, Till we all come into unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. That means a mature man. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's Christ's likeness right there. Verse 14. That we henceforth be no more children. In other words, hey, it's time that we quit being babes in Christ. It's time that we quit being children and acting spiritually like children. It, God wants us to grow up in the faith that we be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. Just because it sounds good, I'm going to believe it. Just because I saw a guy say something on YouTube, well, I believe that now because it sounded really good and he used the Bible. No, no, no. We're not to be carried about by every wind of doctrine. We are to know the truth, and the truth will set us free. Amen. Jesus said, you do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. He goes on here, he says, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. Verse 15, but speaking the truth in love may grow up. You see, that's God's goal. It's for us to come to church. He wants us to be saved, follow him in believer's baptism, join a local New Testament church, 
grow up in the faith, so now we are equipped. We have the tools. We know how to use the tools. And now we're going to go out and become a master craftsman. And we're going to be equipped to go out and do what Jesus, what he wants us to do. And that is to win this world for Jesus Christ. Yeah. He says, but speaking the truth and love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplied, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. You see, God doesn't want us to have a church where we say, well, us four and no more. Yeah. Some churches uh, don't want to have kids. Some kids, because kids tear stuff up. They do. But that's part of the ministry. Those things yeah. happen. Right. Things are going to get torn up. Things are going to wear out. It's going to happen. But we still have a job to do in reaching this world for Christ. Some people, some kids, we have a big Cold Wars event here every year. And kids may come, and every year somebody gets hurt. It's going to happen. But because someone may threaten with a lawsuit, does that mean we stop? No, not, not at all. Things are going to happen. But we have to trust the Lord and follow his leadership because God wants the body of Christ, which is the church. He wants it to increase in growth and increase in number. Now, as a pastor... One of the responsibilities I have is to build you up so you can go out and do the work of God. Now, there are three words in the Bible that are used to describe pastors. Now, this is where it gets informative. Okay, We passed the first practical part. This is the informative part. Three words in the Bible that are used to describe pastors. One is shepherd. What does a shepherd do? A shepherd protects, a shepherd feeds, and a shepherd guides. That's what a shepherd does. That's, that's me. Another word that is used in the Bible to describe pastors is the word elder. Now, let me say this about the word elder. Every time you see the word elder does not mean it's always talking about a pastor. Sometimes it's talking about an elder brother or an elder individual. But when it's talking about a pastor, an elder is like a father. They lead by example in testimony in their marriage, in training children, and in integrity. That's an elder. And then also a bishop. The word bishop means they oversee all the affairs of the church business and ministries. Now, here's my vision for us. First, I want us to be a successful church. Secondly, I want God to use us to help other pastors by training them in our church. I think we have a wonderful church here. We have a lot to offer other young families and especially other young men who are going into the ministry and I think God can use us that way. This has been on my heart now for several years and it's been praying the Lord's timing everything work out and I think the time is here. The work of our church, I'm just going to be honest with you, is too great for me to do alone. Now, let me just give you some duties that I have as a pastor here at this church. Now, my three, I have three main duties, and these require the most of my time. And some of some people, and I'm telling you this because some people, unfortunately, think that preachers only work three hours a week. <laughs> Let me explain to them, and that's the time they're up here preaching, okay? Here's my three main responsibilities I have. Message prep and delivery. For each message I preach, it takes, and this is not delivery time, this is just the prep time, it takes six to eight hours to prepare one message, if I'm going to do it effectively. Counseling. There is prep work that needs to be done for counseling. There's prayer, and then there's the delivery of the counseling. That takes hours. And counseling is, you never know when you're going to be called on, you know, when you need it. And then there's visits, and then driving to visits. This includes hospital visits, sick visits, shut-ins, uh, people who are just not where they're supposed to be, and then people who are new contacts. Now, I'm going to tell you, this is, this is where the ball starts getting dropped. Okay, right here. Some of you have been coming here for a little while. You have yet to receive a visit from me. It's killing me. It's breaking my heart. Because I'm tied up in so many other areas. Now, what are some other responsibilities? I'm just going to read these quickly, just so you are aware of it. Uh, school of the Bible, a prep and delivery. Radio message, prep and delivery. Nursing home services, when we have them. We don't have them. We haven't had them for about a year now or a year and a half. Uh, weddings, counsel for weddings, rehearsal, and then the ceremony. Funerals, visits, food, flowers, meals, service, setup, and cleanup for a funeral. Showers, 
food and errands, and then sometimes set up and clean up. Now, I don't do all the food and errands. I help with those things. Uh, and then uh, unlocking and locking doors. Now, I have help here, thank the Lord. And uh, baptisms and the Lord's Supper. The deacons help with the Lord's Supper, and I appreciate that so very much. Uh, there's also special days, such as graduations day, Mother's Day, Father's Day, uh, baby dedication day. We had six, we're going to have six babies, Lord willing, this year. Yeah. Baby dedication day. Uh, you know, it's getting the gifts for all these things. That takes time to order. Make sure you get all this stuff. Make sure it comes in. Um, organizing trips and activities. I have some help, especially with the young people, but I need help with the older people. Uh, receiving returning phone calls, set up and print prayer sheets, set up and print bulletins, organize a nursery schedule. Uh, I would love to have somebody just say, hey, let me do the nursery schedule. Praise the Lord for that. Uh, receiving return phone calls, set up and print the prayer sheets, set up and print bulletins. All right, I did all that already. I'm sorry, I lost my place. Uh, missionary letters, uh, read and post and schedule speakers and events and use, use of the buildings. Live stream the services, download them to the computer and then upload them to YouTube. Track the faith promise that's given every year. <clears throat> Review the church finances. This is the bills, the budget, the expenses. Uh, see where we can save money. Uh, assist Sharon, who's our bookkeeper, uh, with any financial assistance for record keeping and taxes. Uh, banquets. This is organizing, setting up, cleaning up, skits, games, meals, uh, gifts that need to be bought for the gang banquets. Uh, you know, I would love, we have some help, like the team banquet. Thankfully, I don't have a whole lot to do with that. I could have somebody to say, hey, I'd love to do the Valentine banquet. And boom, there you go. You don't realize how much time stuff like that takes. Uh, the Christmas, you know, thanks for Christmas, the Christmas play, getting the gifts, bus and van routes. We've had several people say, hey, I would like to help out with that. Praise the Lord for that. Uh, the sound equipment, we've had some help there. Internet, we've had some help there. Uh, maintenance, now I've done maintenance a few different ways. But we've got a lot of property here at the church, and praise the Lord for that. We've got four buildings, uh, but, you know, I have to head up work days, projects, do, you know, do a plumbing, do electrical, tractor maintenance, appliances, HVAC, uh, most of the stuff with HVAC stuff, Hunter takes care of, and I thank him for that. Uh, general construction, I have some help in these different areas, things that need to get done. There's a lot of things that go on at our church. Dave said this in the adult Sunday school class, if you're coming to church and you're not sure what to do, it's on you. There is something that can be done for everyone. Now, not everybody in here can do everything. Some of you have never done any plumbing in your life. Count your blessings for that. All right? <laughs> I hate plumbing, but I know how to do it. I can do plumbing. But <coughs> what am I saying all this for? I'm saying this because you've heard the main, three main things I've got to do. To do everything else, it takes more people involved in the work. Now, I think God has prepared our church to this point where we're ready to fulfill a greater vision he has for our church. And that is to bring some people in who can be trained, some people who can be effectively used. Uh, there are some things that maybe I can't turn over to somebody else, but there are some things I can turn over to somebody else. Now, what I would like to have, and I've talked to the men about this, I've been praying about this for a while, and I've even talked to them a couple of times about this. It's about possibly hiring in somebody as a part-time assistant. Uh, you know, we can do a full-time assistant, but I think a part-time assistant to kind of ease into this. And what I've been praying for specifically, and I believe specific prayers get specific answers, is somebody who can do everything that I can do. A secretary can't do the pastoral duties, but somebody who's called to the ministry can. They can help in those areas. There are some things that I specifically have to do, but I need help in those areas. And what we're looking at, I talked to the men here at the last deacons meeting, and uh, they are on board with this, and they agree. Uh, I need help, and I appreciate the men we've had serve as deacons over the years because they are a huge help, and they help out everywhere they can. But people are busy. We're just, we're busy people. We're all busy people. And I want to say this too. I appreciate many of you who have come up to me and said, hey, if you need any help, let me know. Let me say that's helpful in a way, but in another way, it doesn't help me as much as maybe you're thinking it helps me. And here's why. Because if there's an emergency that happens here on the property, instead of me going through my list of people who said that I'll help and trying to call and find somebody who's going to fix it, I can already fix the thing and have it done. So that is more work I would have to do. And then, you know, make sure everything's done. You have all the stuff to do the job and all that. It'd be easier just to get the job done. But if it's something that, like the nursery schedule, 
I'd rather just turn that baby over to somebody and say, here's the people, here's what, here's what I've done, here's, you can do it from here. That would be something I can take my hands completely off. But, again, I'm looking at somebody and I talk to them, somebody just part-time, six to ten hours a week. Now, Brother Harper mentioned this to me when we were here, when they were here last time. He said, uh, it's Brother Walt, he goes, you realize a church this size usually has a full-time secretary and a full-time assistant. I said, yes, I'm aware of that. I don't think we're at that point yet. But I think this is where the Lord's taking us. I think it may be a while down the road, but I think we're point. If we're going to continue to grow, our church must grow in every area. And, again, I think we have a wonderful church. We have a lot to offer an individual. I'm looking for somebody six to ten hours a week. Hey, if we can come along and just kind of help out, that means they would have to have a full-time job. Let me tell you how God's worked all this out. We have an individual in our church that is called the ministry. He's going to be a pastor someday. Dan Santucci. He's got a full-time job, but he can also use a little help financially. Well, guess what? God put all those pieces together. It wasn't somebody manipulating things behind the scenes. I've talked to Dan about this. Dan said, man, I would, I would love to do some of this. I would love to be trained. He served in two different churches already. It's hard when you serve in a church. I served in two churches uh, before I came here, and then I was a lay person in another church. But it's hard when you're on staff in another church, and you want the pastor to kind of take you under their wing and teach you things that you're not going to ever get in Bible college. But that doesn't happen. He didn't get it. I didn't get it. That's what I want to do. That's what I think God's put in my heart to do so they can learn with us. Now, all that being said, the men are on board for bringing Dan on part-time. And uh, we had talked about this, and this may sound a little too, uh, as far as income, we're just looking at 100 a week. You know, we pay 180 a week roughly uh, to clean the church buildings. Uh, we have the buildings, you know, all clean and take care. I think that's, you know, that's a fair wage. 100 a week. It's not asking much at all. We easily can afford that. Uh, and that actually is what he was thinking of in his head. And it just worked out. Now, here's what the deacons and I have talked about. That if we need to reevaluate this, maybe he's putting in more time than what's there. Because the workman is worthy of his hire. Yeah. I'm not wanting to starve anybody out. So, if he's worthy of his hire and he's putting in 15, 20 hours a week, we need to reconsider this. We need to do something different for him and his family. Now... I want you all to be a part of this, and here's how. Here's the last part of the practical part of the message. I want you all to be a part of this, so here's what I need from you all. First of all, I need you to pray about this. Uh, we're going to uh, bring this up, and we're going to have you, you all vote on because I want you to have your say in it. If you have any questions or any concerns, uh, you can write them down, give them to me or one of the deacons, or you can just ask us, and then we will discuss it, and then... Next Sunday evening, Lord willing, uh, we're planning to just vote and, hey, you know, let's at least take this next step of faith and see what God does with it. Now, what I would like to do, my further vision down the road, I don't know how long Dan will be here. I would love for their family to be here for the next 15, 20 years. Probably not going to happen, though. God's probably going to eventually call him to another church, maybe a year and a half, two years, three years down the road. I don't know when it's going to happen. That may happen. But here's my future vision for the church. There's a lot of guys coming out of Bible college. Even while they're in Bible college, they need to do an internship over the summer. God can use our church for that. God uses other churches for that. They can help us, but we can help them. We can help them in many different ways. And then, maybe once they graduate, they're ready to go into the ministry. But I'll tell you this, they can't be a pastor yet because they'll be a novice. And what they'll do is they'll destroy a church when they get in so they need to learn somewhere. They need to grow somewhere. And, and I've already talked to Jody about this you know, with the youth. I'm not asking somebody to come in and take somebody else's job. You've heard the list. Somebody says, well, what, what's he going to do? Any one of those other 30 things I mentioned. You know, whatever will help me the most so as he helps me, I can help you. And as I'm helping you, guess what we're doing? We're helping accomplishing the work of Christ. That is the goal for a church. That's what God wants us to do. Here's the last practical part of the message. I want you to pray about this. But I want you to be prayerful for me. I need prayer for wisdom. I need prayer for health. Not that my health is suffering. But I'll tell you, you take the stress of all of these things on all the time, your health wears down. Yep. 
I can't fight sicknesses like I used to. I have a very strong constitution. Praise the Lord for that. I can fight illnesses very well. But I'm realizing because of the stress, I can't fight things off as well as I used to. Plus, I'm getting older. That doesn't help either. But uh, pray for wisdom. Pray for help. Pray for my family. The devil wants to destroy my family just like he wants to destroy your family. And then be faithful. Be faithful in your attendance. When you're faithful in your attendance, this makes my counseling easier. You can't, I can't tell you how many times I've counseled people in this office. And I've heard the problems. I've gone through the problems. And I said, you know, I just preached on that two weeks ago. I preached on that four weeks ago. And I preached on that six weeks ago. And I have to print my messages off and hand them to them. And you know what? They weren't here for any of them. Be faithful in your attendance. It will help you to be built up so you can become a stronger Christian. But be, it's kind of like sheep in a fold. If you have a shepherd, it's not the sheep that are all bunched together that consumes your time. It's that one that runs off. That's the one that consumes the time. So be in your place. Do what God wants you to do. Grow. Be faithful in your growth. Grow stronger. And it's kind of like a team, a football team. If I'm a star quarterback, and I'm not, but if I was a star quarterback, and everybody else on the team was pathetic on offense, it's going to make my job really hard. But maybe I have a good line, and I don't have any good receivers, and I don't have any good running backs. It makes our job easier, but there's still some areas that need work. But if we all become stronger together, guess what? We become an unstoppable force. Yeah. That's what we want for the cause of Christ. <laughs> So be faithful in these areas. Be faithful when you're witnessing. That's a successful church. And then be given. Be given. Give your time. The Bible says redeeming the time because the days are evil. We need to realize we're only allotted so much time in this life. Right. What are you going to do? Are you wasting your time? Or are you using your time effectively for the cause of Christ? Give your time. Give your talents. God gives you wisdom and he uses the gifts that he's given you. Every one of us has talents in different areas. And use your talents for the glory of God. Use your gifts for the glory of God. Whatever he's equipped you to be able to do. And then give your treasures. This is the financial support to accomplish God's work. And many of you do that already. But this, these are the things that we need. So those are some things that you can do to help us accomplish, I believe, this, this goal that God wants. You know, we can't all do everything. But here's the thing. We all can do something. Yeah. We all can do something for the cause of Christ. Where there is no vision, the people perish. And I just want to be honest with you. I told the deacons this too. God has been good to this church. Yeah. He's been good to this church. How do I know? Now, and please understand, I'm not lifting myself up at all. Preacher John was here for 31 years. He was a man of many talents. He knew how to do a lot of things. He helped head up projects. He helped work on tractors, the buses, the vans, the vehicles. That's what he was able to do. I, God's blessed me with a background in plumbing, electrical, contracting, other things. I have a background. I know how to do that stuff. But most pastors have the softest hands you'll ever shake hands with. Because they don't know how to do any of these things. And my goal is to prepare you for the next man that comes in. You say, you're leaving? Well, I'm not planning on being here for the next hundred years. I don't know when Christ is going to come back and call us home. But if he takes me out by way of death, I'll be here as long as God wants me here. If he wants me here until I'm 70, praise the Lord, I'll be here until I'm 70. But here's the thing. My job is to prepare you to prepare this church for the next man that comes in to help make his job easier. Preacher John did that for me. He made my job easier. It was a, I've never come across any place that's had a smoother transition than what we've had here at Cashmere Baptist Church. We had one pastor taking one pastor stepping down, another pastor taking over. This was the smooth. I've talked to pastors all over the country, and they've never seen it happen this smoothly. God was in it. Yeah. That's right. right. I want God to be in the next one, and the next one, and the next one. But the only way that's going to happen is if we do our part now. Where does it start? It starts with salvation. Do you know that you're saved? Do you have a settled in your life? And then after salvation, have you been baptized by immersion since your salvation? And if you have, if you've done those two things, have you joined this local New Testament church? If you've not done that, 
And God's been speaking to you. I'm going to tell you, he's probably been trying to speak to you about these things. Have you been listening? This is God's will for our life. This is what he wants. And then once we do these things, we need to grow stronger in the Lord. Now, if you're a member of a church and you're visiting here and you're a member of a church somewhere else, I hope you appreciate the pastor God gave you. I know our church, they show me their appreciation all the time, and I, I've never felt so blessed in my life. We've got a great group of people, I believe. A great family. I think this is a family church, Amen. as it should be. Now, what does God want us to do? If you don't know Christ, you're saved, but let's get saved. Let's all stand. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your blessings. I know, Lord, that was a lot to go over, a lot to cover. But, Lord, I pray that we will be a successful church. That is my heart, Lord. That's what I want. I want to be successful what you've given me to do, my personal calling. But, Lord, I want our people to be successful. I want us to be reaching this world for Jesus Christ. I want you to guide and direct our steps. I want uh, to always be in the center of your will and how you're leading and directing. I don't want to drag my feet, but, Lord, I don't want to get ahead of you either. And, Lord, I pray that you will open our understanding. Give us the wisdom. I pray for our people as we think about you know, this next step. I pray that you will uh, help us all to have the same burden and help us all to be working together in the unity of the faith because, Lord, that is what your will is for us. And, Lord, if there's someone in our service here this morning who has never placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, Lord, they need to do that today. They can do it right where they're standing. They can accept you by faith, call upon your name by faith, and you'll save them right there. Or maybe they'd just like to come and we can show them from an open Bible how they can get us saved. Maybe there's someone here who needs to be baptized. I pray that you give them the courage and strength to step out where they are, meet me up here up front, and say, Pastor, I've never, I've never followed the Lord in believers' baptism. I need to get that done. Or maybe, Lord, they've done these first two things, but they've never joined this local New Testament church. They would like to be a part of this family. We would love to have them, but we want your will to be done. Father, we ask and pray all these things. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 247. 247. As we sing a few verses, God spoke to your heart. Won't you come? 247. Jesus is tenderly calling me home, calling today, calling today. Fly from the sunshine of love, will thou roam farther and farther?
God, we just ask for someone here that does not know thee as your personal Savior, God, that they would uh, seek someone out, God, that they would take their Bible and show them how they can know for sure that they're going to heaven, God. We pray that uh, each Christian here would just go and be obedient to your will for their lives, and God, that we continue to draw closer to you and that they can see you through our lives. We ask it often in your Son, Jesus Christ, amen.